Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Atlantic Bushcraft Adventures. Tonight, episode 170, and I thought we'd give a little chat about uh, vehicle survival. And just as I was talking about with Ben there, we did have a uh, comment come in, just a question, and I thought it'd be great to do a little episode on this, be it a uh, short episode, long episode, you know how our short episodes usually end up, Ben, being generally some of our longest. But in any case, the question was, what is some stuff... They would recommend to have in your vehicle in case you were, you know, out bombing around the backwoods or something like that and you had a breakdown, no cell reception. Is there stuff you could take to help you stay in the vehicle and potentially maybe stuff that you could throw in that would help you stay out of the vehicle or get your vehicle out of a sticky situation with some other ideas that Ben and I were talking about here? So instead of just writing a quick email and shooting it back with the message, I figured we'd do a quick episode uh, and maybe there'll be some good tidbits of information that other people may pull from too. And if nothing else, you guys will get our normal ramblings and entertainment because, uh, apparently just before the, the show here, we were learning that Ben has lots of experience with vehicles that could potentially break down, <laughs> but that's a whole other story for around a campfire. Just know that Ben is very experienced. <laughs> We, we all have a fast, but <laughs> <laughs> that's fair. So let's start at the beginning, I guess. Let's go with a little pre-preparedness before, you know, you actually get uh, the breakdown here in the woods. We'll talk about that here in a minute. What's some stuff that you can carry in your vehicle for emergency preparedness, specifically when you're going around the backwoods? Like I'm talking old wagon roads, you know, the kind of stuff, um, <sighs> Honestly, that we do. We just go, you know, there's a road, wonder where that goes. And you just start wandering up it. You have no idea where it's going to go or what kind of trouble you're going to get into. Or if there's going to be cell phone reception, which is the big one. Nowadays, everybody's like, oh, you just call someone. Well, that's good if you can make that call. But what if you can't? So what you're describing is a trip to the grocery store when I was growing up. So, <laughs> See, th this is what I meant, folks. <laughs> so for those who know me, those who are familiar... I'm exaggerating a tiny bit because the store was in town, but we were 72 kilometers from the next nearest town, and a lot of people weren't the most um, well-to-do. So we, we drove a lot of vehicles that were in maybe less new condition than would be ideal. So, And the weather was bad, so you had to prepare. You had to be ready in case something happened. If something broke down, if you got stuck, and if you went you know, off the road, and got, you had to have options. So... First and foremost, always have a first aid kit in your vehicle. Um, I have a decent first aid kit in both my vehicles. It's a pretty standard thing for me. You never know what could happen. Um, you know, you could come across an accident. You could get in an accident. You, should, you could get out and do something. You never know. First aid kit, absolutely, absolutely a must. And you should learn how to use a lot of stuff in it. So if you have stuff in the in first aid kit, Try to know how to use it. But even if you don't, you never know. Maybe the other people in the area, when you do have an accident, might know how to use some of that stuff. So having it there just because you don't know doesn't mean it won't get used because you never know what situation you'll end up in. Uh, so that that's my first thing. I recommend going out and getting a pre-made good first aid kit for that because it's a vehicle one. And it's not like when we talk about personal kits and you're going into woods that's a bit different with a vehicle. You have the room in the, the size, right? You can get nice ones. They'll fit under your seat or hang off the back of your seat. You can just put them in your trunk. They can go in your glove box, but it, get a decent one, you know, with with most of the stuff you'll need. Um, it includes like, a, you know, a barrier device for, for mouth to mouth, uh, a variety of, of uh, band-aids and, yeah, should be some scissors. Uh, potentially a small amount of medicine, things that can stop bleeding, splint kit, things like that. A good kit. Um, I highly recommend that. It's funny enough, a good first aid kit's almost a necessity for any vehicle regardless of what you're doing. I do have one in my vehicle, much like Ben said. A decent one, vehicle made one. Uh, I started with and then I just kind of expanded from there. And it's surprising how often you use that when you're not in a quote-unquote survival or woodsy situation. I mean, I use my personal vehicle responding to emergency calls and stuff like that. And a triangle bandage. You'll just, you know, you may need something like that to make a splint or you just need it for a variety of other reasons. Anybody that's 
knows what a triangle bandage is, probably knows exactly how many uses you got for one of these things. Uh, but if you do do stuff like that, be sure to upkeep your first aid kit as well. Don't just take and take and take and take and never try to replenish and say, oh yeah, I got a first aid kit in there because everybody gets guilty of that that I know of. They take their little personal first aid kits, they buy it, uh, and they use a couple things, spe specifically the band-aids. You know what I mean? If there's no band-aids in a first aid kit, it's really not that good to you, but it's always the first things to always leave. Yeah, so I, I can't can't agree with you anymore. <laughs> it, no, but that, know, that's you know what I mean. Thing. So first aid kit, um, first aid kit, keep it maintained. Um, the the amount of ways you can get injured is is pretty vast, uh, and the vehicle is a great way to to move good good products. Um, next to that, I would say a good supply of water. Uh, have a few good water bottles in the vehicle with you. Uh, you don't know whether you'll need it to to drink, to clean something, or potentially if you have uh, overheating problems, you can fill the rad and maybe get a little bit further. So just having, you know, some water in the vehicle um, has a ton of uses. So I, I recommend having some water in your vehicle. Uh, to go with that, I'd also say a bit of food. Um, even a few candies. That's yeah. literally the one out of my truck. Like that, I keep that under the rear seat. It's just, yeah. it's a store bought MRE. And I always have a couple of cans of these floating around somewhere. They're just like legitimately little fruit candies. Uh, mm -hmm. You'd be surprised how long you can go with just that handful of stuff. Oh, yeah. And if you come across someone who's diabetic and you need to help them with that, a good sweet, big actual something with actual sugar in it helps, can help them. But there's a ton of energy in it. Um, so it works really good. Um, next, a light source and potentially a heat source. I keep a bottle candle in my my vehicle. I have one of these or something like this. This is not the exact one, but it was the closest one I could for an example. Like the five-hour emergency candles. I generally always have one of those in every vehicle. I have the one in the glass jar. Mm-hmm. And I bet you that thing will go for 24 hours. You like that. It'll go forever. Oh, for and sure. Honestly, the beauty of that is if you knock it over, you're less likely to catch anything on fire. But the other nice thing is it'll it'll provide heat in, in, a, in, a, in a car. And if you doubt that, ask any teenager with a car who <laughs> needs to heat it up in the winter. It works, right? So you go out, you like the thing, you put it in the car. It'll keep the chill out. It allows you to stay in the car for quite a while without running the car because that, you know, gas is expensive. Uh, but if if the car won't run, so you go out and, and it breaks down, you ran out of fuel, you you know, it's it's dark. You have to wait till morning to figure it out. If you have a candle, you can light that candle and it'll keep keep the chill out and get you through the night. You know, uh, through all but probably the coldest nights, uh, it, it'll be. It'll give you a lot of comfort. So I highly recommend some kind of way to do that. If you may it is not open... be sweating, but you won't huh? die. I said you may not be sweating, but you probably won't die. Yeah, if you if you want to sweat, you're going to want to get a partner. Um, <laughs> do aerobics. Yeah, don't break down by yourself. If you're looking to stay really warm, you need, you need that body heat. Um, so... And when you were talking about flashlights, something that I do with all my keys, like this, once again, literally the keys out of my truck, I got one of those little O lights on there. And this thing is super bright. Uh, I don't want to shine it. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. It's a camera, but I mean, uh, super bright. I can charge it from the truck. It's just a little micro USB cable. Um, and I check it regularly and keep it charged up. And I mean, uh, I have one of those on every single one of my keychains, regardless of what vehicle I have. So Mel's car has one on it. My motorcycle has one on it. The ATV has one on it. Like a flashlight is a necessity. Yeah, I keep a flashlight in my vehicles too, because um, you don't know. You just pop the hood, want to see what's going on underneath it. You, you hear, you know, you're driving along, you hear something bang underneath. You want to check, make sure nothing was damaged. Uh, anything like to check around your vehicle. If you need to go pee, whatever reason you stop, you need to get out. Having a light, it's just, it just makes sense. Like just do it. Um, I've seen ones that plug into your outlet and they, they stay there and they're always charging. Mm -hmm. There's, there's lots of options for lights out there. Find what works for you. Um, 
and uh, and use it, right? Make sure that it's charged. Make sure the bulbs are good. Check them regularly. Um, problem with anything with the batteries, if you leave it too long and don't pay attention to it, it could the battery could fail and can sometimes take your bat your your flashlights out, especially ones that take like the A's and C's. You know, yeah, right they'll start corroding, and break it down, then they leak. It ruins everything inside. Um, just before we change on lighting, this is something else I carry in the truck. This is literally a tiny half watt light that mm. runs off USB. And my truck has several USB ports in it. So providing the battery doesn't fail, uh, I can literally throw one of these on and it'll run for literally months before it kills the battery because of how low wattage it is, which if you have your flashlight like mine, it might run for two hours. You know what I mean? Because it is a small flashlight. And if I'm sitting in the truck and I can't run it, I don't want to leave all the lights on because maybe I'm not fully broken down. Maybe I just got to wait till morning or whatever the case may be. I can throw one of those in, get tons of light in my truck and not killing the battery any significant amount. And I, yeah. I got like 10 of them for $2 on Amazon or something. Not bad. Bad at all. So, so yeah. So, flashlight. Um so, and that co covers you for a lot of stuff. So, so far, what have we gone through? We've we've said, you know, have some food, have some water, have a first aid kit, have a flashlight. And I think you'll find most people have that in their vehicle. Anyways, now we're talking about you're going off the road. Uh, you're going to probably a bit more uh, isolated, maybe f a lot fewer vehicles. Uh, have your standard complement of tools, you know, your jack, your tire iron things that should be part of your vehicle anyway. So make sure that those things are still there. I keep a small toolkit in my, each of my vehicles. So I have, you know, this, this full set of screwdrivers, a couple of pairs of pliers, uh, and a full socket set um, to do most repairs you can do on the vehicle. With that being said, I mean, you should be able to tighten down a hose clamp. You should be able to replace a spark plug. Um, we were joking earlier, and, and you guys didn't hear it, obviously. Keep a, keep a thing of, of uh, snare wire in your vehicle. It's surprising how often you can just tie something up or reattach something, hook up, you know, reattach a wire to itself, you know, quickly twist it together, things like that. Having those basic tools can oftentimes fix things um, and get you out of a bad spot. So just basic toolkit. It never hurts to know how how your vehicle works. It surprises me how oftentimes you'll meet somebody who will tell you, I've never had the hood of my vehicle open, or I have no idea how, you know, how to change the spark plugs or how to check the oil or how to check the fluids. Everyone should know how to check your own fluids. Uh, I don't, you know, that's there's no excuse. Well, that's uh, just basic maintenance. That's not doing work to your car. That is maintaining your vehicle at that point. Right. You should know how to check and make sure you had enough windshield washer fluid, that the rad fluid isn't too low, that you have transmission fluid in there, that the oil is still there. Like check your basic fluids and, uh, you know, check your vehicle before you leave. And then if something happens, you know, you, you can check and you have a reference point and say, oh, geez, you know, I had transmission fluid when I left. Like, I don't know why it has none now, but, you know. <laughs> no, and that does happen. I mean, like you said, I know people that wouldn't even know that you had to check transmission fluid. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, oh, I just bring my car to the shop. That's fine. I, I understand if you're not comfortable doing repairs to your vehicle, but you should at yeah. least have the basic knowledge on how to make sure your vehicle's safe and going to go. Yeah. Um, so ha have that stuff. Also, it never hurts to have some spare fuel. So if you're going off road, take a, you know, take five liters, 10 liters, 15, 20 liters. It depends on what you got for a vehicle, how far you're going. But it doesn't hurt to have, you know, uh, just trying to think. Five liters will get your average vehicle between 20 and 50 kilometers. You know? Yeah, that should be about right. Did that. Should, should get you out of the woods most times. Or at least get you a hell of a lot closer. Um, so... Do I carry spare fuel every time? No. But if I'm doing an, an overland style trip, if I'm going to go back a road that I'm not used to and I'm not sure how much exploring I want to do, I'll take some spare fuel. Make sure I fill up before I, I leave leave my, you know, the known road. Uh, so, uh, but take that extra bit of fuel if you can. Uh, 
No, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think how much fuel I usually try to bring. And I guess it's just my five gallon can. I got or whatever it is. Yeah, whatever. Mm -hmm. And it, it just ratchet straps in the back and off I go. Uh, I do have some specialty tools that I'll mention later on that I kind of put with that. These are just the, or I guess for now, I guess I was trying to stay to the common stuff that everybody would throw in. You know what I mean? Uh, Chris joins us tonight. How's it going, Chris Loveless? Um, so yeah, we talked about first aid kits, food, water, um, little extra fuel, uh, candle, flashlight. I think that's a pretty good junk for what everybody, like, that's not even a survival situation to me. That's just no. the stuff I carry in my vehicle. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and because we're talking overland, I'm going to throw this out there because I've seen it and, and, and I'm sort of in that situation myself. Um, if you have a standard jack in your vehicle and you go put oversized tires on your vehicle, you may want to consider doing something else because that standard jack may not actually get your tire off the ground. It may just be. So my Forester has slightly oversized tires and in the wrong situation, it will not pick the tires up high enough now to change them. So, you know, you fix that with a piece of two by four, right? Like put a piece of two by four underneath the jack and all of a sudden you're high enough up. You, you, you have to brace it. It's fine and dandy to think when you get out there, oh, there'll be something I can stick a, stick a rock under it. You don't want to be trying to jack on top of a rock. It's not, it's not, you know, chances of finding a good straight, flat, level rock that's going to work well for that, it's kind of slim. Get some blocking, put it aside. It doesn't take up much room. Stick it under a car, seats or something. Like just put it somewhere. Uh, so when you, if you ever have to jack it up, because you don't know what situation you're going to end up in. If the ground's soft, the jack's going to sink down into it. Now, you know, you're already lost two inches because you put the bigger tires on and now you're losing another two inches to sink. Well, you know, the jack's only going up 10 inches total and you've got a 10, 10 inch clearance. It's not even lifting the vehicle yet. Right. So, no, and that's exactly it. And you know what? That's a big thing. A lot of people don't understand. Like just going back to the basics off it, you throw oversized uh, tires on your car your jack was designed for the original size tires and it doesn't take a whole lot before you can't change your tire. And the other thing is if you did put oversized tires on, is your spare now going to go on and not cause you more complications? Uh, and I do know like if you're driving around the highway, it's not such a big difference, especially if you got uh, free rolling axles and stuff like that, you can get away with it and limp yourself around. But mm -hmm. if you are bombing around the backwoods and expecting your four wheel drive to work and you've got one tire that's smaller than the rest, you are going to have some troubles and and potentially cause yourself some other damage there with CV joints or uh, universals, yokes, whatever, right? So yeah. just something to be, just something to keep in mind. Um, again, just thinking of standard things. Um, if you've changed your wheels and lug nuts, make sure you have the right so size socket. Um, and if it has special locking nuts, make sure you have that on your vehicle. Otherwise, you get back there, you left it somewhere safe at home, and all of a sudden now it's safe at home and you're in the woods and there's no chance of getting a tire off because one of the lug nuts does not match. <laughs> you know? And that's true. How? So so that, that's a few things there. i just trying to think. There's something else in the nagging in the back of my head that I'm thinking people should have. But they just might not think of them. We'll, we'll come. Maybe we'll come And if back. it does, we'll mention it through. I was, I'm trying to think, and I think I covered most of the points I had on my list anyway. Uh, and once again, that's just general items for every vehicle. My car has it. My truck has it. Even if we're not going in the woods, that stuff's still in there. And then there's a couple things uh, that I'll now throw on that I add in. Like, this would be in my truck, but it's not in Mel's car, for instance. Because my truck, yeah. I have the potential that I'm, I'm driving along. Ah, oh, there's a woods road. I wonder where it goes. You know what I mean? I could bomb down it. So, and I have the convenience of a toolbox sitting in the back. So I have a little extra room. I can indulge a little bit more. So some of the things I indulge in is I generally have a blanket or a small sleeping bag in there. And I mean, it's not my best high quality one that takes up a ton of wood or ton of, ton of room and weight, but it's something. It's better than having nothing. I always have a blanket. I fold a blanket up. It sits on the back seat or it sits in the window or just in the trunk. But I always have a blanket somewhere back there. So that's a good point. Um, survival blanket, or even those windshield reflective things, 
stick those in your window to keep it warmer inside or cooler. Uh, so that, that's a good idea. Um, Just a here, call. Here, sorry. I was going to say some additional tools that we should probably have in your vehicle. Uh, a saw. Shovel. Potentially an axe. So you get stuck. You never know what what will happen. Being able to cut down a few trees, stick underneath the tires, maybe to get it jacked up or, or boost it. Um, you get back there and there's a tree down in your way. You may have to remove the tree to continue on. It could be in a storm. The road's blocked. You can't get past it. So having a couple of tools like that will allow you to clear the road and, and move forward. A uh, shovel would allow you to potentially dig out if you get stuck or if there's a big hole, you may be able to fill it in a bit, help, you know, close that gap and be able to move on or get back, especially in a washout situation. Um, those tools are really helpful. Um, toilet paper. We didn't mention toilet paper. Nope. <laughs> and I thought of that not too long ago myself and both my vehicles have toilet paper in it regardless. Yeah. I've been on responded to too many fire calls and needed toilet paper to not have toilet paper in my truck. Yeah. yeah. You, you, you don't want to ever miss that. But yeah, have those tools. The other thing I've been really thinking about, and I've, I'm debating on two, um, an electric chainsaw or a cordless reciprocating saw. Mm -hmm. Either way, like with the, prune, with the pruner blade on it, either way can make short work for some wooden stuff. And if you need to, to get a little fire or something going, those things can help you out. The other thing I have talked about yeah, I'm going to throw it out there, is an angle grinder. An so electric angle grinder? Little cordless one. Takes the 12-volt battery, 20-volt ba battery, whatever. Uh, I have a 20-volt system from Canadian Tire I use. I'm Those are some of the next tools on my list. And it's because I don't know how many times the angle grinder has helped me with repairs and stuff. And if you get back there and you get in the right situation, you may need to cut through a piece of metal to continue on. Uh there's not much you can't cut through with an angle grinder. No, the couple zip discs, you can make quick work of a lot of stuff. And honestly, something that you may have thought of, may not have, if you're doing some serious uh, rock crawling or just in a lot of muddy, ruddy areas, if you dip down low and something hits your wheel well and crushes it into your tire, as much as it may pain you, it's better to cut that metal away and you know run the risk if you have to replace the fender than have it dig into your tire and potentially hold you up. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you're doing it with an older vehicle, but very true point all the same. I have seen times when we've had to take an ax and hack pieces of metal off because otherwise they'd be going into the steering system or, uh, yeah. into the tires or something like that. And an angle grinder would just made that so much simpler. Oh man. Uh, it's, it's a great tool. Um, you know, I've, I've fixed many a thing with it, or at least it's been a tool that I needed broken bolt no other way to get it off grind it head off and, and, and get it out and stuff like that uh, a very useful tool it's surprising how often it comes in in handy and those 12 volt power systems like you know you can get an impactor drill you know you can get that you can have the whole thing there three or four batteries will run every piece of equipment there you can charge them up it's a power supply system uh so something like that it's easy to have a little system built in the back of your vehicle to hold those um, and I think if you, you watch a lot of the big, um, uh, overlanders, they have a lot of this stuff just there. Right. Um, and it's, if everyone in this, in the group is running the same piece of equipment. So if everyone's running DeWalt, you don't all have to have every tool and everyone has a couple of batteries, so you can pretty well run the tools. Um, so if you're with, going with a bunch of, of people, never hurts to try to all be on the same system. Um, the other tool I recommend if you don't already have a wench is mm -hmm. a come along. And if, if you know what a come along is, it's a, it's a cable system similar to a wench. Usually you can only get a few inches with it at a time or maybe a foot or two, but you'll move a lot with it. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I have a two ton, but it has the, the pulley on it. So you can pull four tons with it. Mm -hmm. Um, you can get pretty stuck. And it'll give you some positive pressure, help get you in there. I mean, it's a hell of a lot more than I can physically push. 
Oh, for sure. And they're not really that complicated. Once again, would you throw it in the back of your truck just or car and have it as your daily driver? Maybe not. Maybe you do. Maybe you got the room for that, in all honesty. Like, there is some stuff I leave in my toolbox regardless um, if I'm going into the woods or not. And it's probably more than what most people would. And that that's where that would fall in. You know what I mean? It would probably just get thrown in the box and it would be just left there in case. Because I'm most likely going to need it in my truck before I need it anywhere else. Mine, I have a, what I've done up, and, and this is a good idea, I went down to Rona or whatever, and I bought one of these um, plastic totes, the, the snapping lid, tough type thing, and I stick a lot of this equipment in there, and it's just set there, so that's my, I'm going, exploring, <laughs> going exploring box, so when I'm going to the grocery store, it doesn't have to take up, a, you know, half my trunk, uh, and it sits in my basement. So, you know, because my vehicle, my exploring vehicle is also my daily driver. So uh, I can't always afford to give up that much space all the time. So I have some quick modular kits. I can grab the kit I need for the day. I have a search and rescue one. I have an exploring one. They have a lot of similar stuff, but one has, you know. Um, and the other thing I have that I can strap on there because I have racks and stuff is traction boards. Hmm. Uh, and you can make something similar with a few pieces of tree or whatever in the woods. Not quite as good. Trees can be slippery. Um, you can try to stick your, your floor mats underneath, ruins them. It's really hard on them. Uh, or you can have a proper traction board, which can also act as a shovel. I've used them in the winter. They're, they're fairly good. And if that prevents you from having to call a tow truck to come into the woods an hour and a half in, well, like I said, we have a couple comments here on the side from Chris. Um, funny you say that. Worst fear of mine came true a while back. Uh, had a flat tire, had everything to fix it, but one of the lug nuts was rusted and couldn't get it off. Uh, Nico was to say had to pay an arm and a leg for it to be towed out of the forest. And those are all points that we just talked about yeah. in our, our talk there. He had his comments up first, but we just kind of fluidly went through them, so all good. Uh, another thing oh. he mentioned is... Floor mat is a great one for first time use or one time use. That's true. And something he mentioned was a portable bidet. If that's something that you find is necessary and you want to take it with you. I have seen them from Amazon for like 13 bucks. You can connect them into a water bottle. And I mean, they're the health issue wise. Some people have like Crohn's and stuff like that. That might be a necessary item for them uh, that oh, we man. would take for granted. You know what I mean? You know, if you, this is off topic, but if you don't, take good care of yourself down there especially day or two into the woods you can be a pretty sore person and you're going to really regret it so being able to get yourself good and clean uh, especially if you could be out there for a few days something not like a that. bad idea um, a tire repair kit so they're not that expensive pick them up anywhere canadian tire rona you name it and know uh, how to use it don't buy a tire plug kit and have no idea what it's for you know I know some people say you're not supposed to use it here, you're not supposed to use it there, but honestly, if you're in the woods and it's the only way to get you out, you stick it there. Yep. And, and figure it out when you get out there, you know, even if it gets you to the road and not even past the road and it fails, at least you got further out than you were. Don't put a tire pit repair kit in and then decide, I'm going to keep going. You know, this Don't is have the it there, you... need it, never use it. Uh, but I, I have a tire repair kit, and sometimes it is easier to repair a tire than to replace it. Uh, along the same lines, an air compressor, like the little tiny uh, ones. I There's can't. A couple of them. Oh, sorry. Uh, I want to upgrade what I have, but you know I have the cheap one from Canadian Tire. It's worked adequately. Um, but the other thing is, you, there's one out there by a company. I think it's called Slime, and you can inject the ant the like the the leak the puncture seal right into your tire using that pump so it'll pump the tire up but it'll also inject this chemical into it keeping that, in mind that if you use those when you actually go to fix the tire they are going to be po'd at you but you will have gotten out of where you were stuck you know what some of the new cars that's all they come with there is no spare yeah and that's exactly it the old ronda uh, rondo that Mel had. That's all it had was like a fix a flat in the rear. This this car now has a full rear, uh, spare tire, which is nice. Um, yeah. But yeah, a decent air compressor. I can't, rem 
I can't actually describe how often I use the one out of my truck for everything. Uh, pumping up a tire here, there, not just on the cars, uh, Lily's bicycle, wheelbarrow tires. Uh, I put a few pounds in a, in a, uh, a basketball. No, I was thinking a water pump. Uh, the pressure tank and a water pump because it just happened to be there and I could pull up close to it. Like, you'd be surprised how often you use it. Oh man, it's it's a great tool. Um, you know, we talked about it before. We were talking about like building the idea system. If you have an an overlanding vehicle, you can actually pre plumb it and have all the water the the tubes inside your vehicle waiting basically at the tire, and you can have it more or less permanently set up in the vehicle, turn the pump on, it'll pressurize all the lines and then just have a short lead to do each tire. And then you can hook one to each of the tires and equalize the pressure. So even if you can't run the pump, you can take a few pounds off all the tires and make them all even. Yep. So uh, if you're off-roading and you get stuck, believe it or not, knocking a few pounds out of your tire might get you out. And we've talked about this in, I think, our overlanding podcast there a while back. People were found... Uh deceased from leaving their vehicles and people went in dropped a few pounds and drove their vehicle out yeah so people who thought that their, their vehicle was stuck beyond possibility of getting out of there it was drove out without even having to be pushed and all they did was knock instead of 35 psi which is what i think the vehicle recommended they put it down to 20 psi and drove home like yep you know and a little bit of knowledge about stuff like that too goes a long way um, one last thing I want to talk about, well, a couple things before we move on, because I, I noticed we're up to a half hour already. I'm actually surprised we're eating up this much time, but I do carry a couple things in my toolbox, uh, standard for me, maybe just to get some juices flowing and people out there that haven't thought about these things. Uh, I carry a tarp. Not only can I use it for a shelter if I didn't want to stay with the vehicle or whatever, I want to sleep outside. But if you're working on the vehicle, you can make a little rain shelter. And man, it is so much nicer to work on something when you're not wet. Yeah, um, no, yeah you know what I mean? And there's a hundred uses for a tarp. A $4 tarp from the dollar store is all I got in there. It's nothing fancy. Anytime I use it, I just go buy a new one. I don't bother trying to fold it back up and put it back in its fancy little package. No, I just take it home and now a wood pile tarp and I buy a new one. You know what I mean? And I suggest everybody does that. Um, yeah, and man, you get stuck in the mud or something, just throw it on the ground and you can lay on that. It just keeps you cleaner and more comfortable. There's a there's a million and one reasons to have a tarp. So that's, you know, it makes a lot of sense. Um, something else I run, I have a junk garden hose. Um, and you know what I... This is from a lesson I learned in the past. I have my old couple rangers ago it was a red one i had i was going back to the waterfalls where you and i were ben before the path was a little better than it was tore the gas tank off it yeah so with a junk of garden hose and a couple hose clamps you can literally gravity feed enough fuel to get you out of the woods because i've concocted this thing and it worked um yeah. But yeah, a junk of guard knows that it comes in for other things too. If you got something that's chafing, you can make a chafe guard for it. Maybe you're going with a buddy and, you know, you're abandoning one vehicle. You can take some gas out if you have an older vehicle and they don't have the siphon filters in there. Like, it's just another thing that comes in handy for oddities to just have in there. Oh, yeah. No. Um, yeah. With a lot of the stuff you know, skill and ability to use it, but, you know, having it there. And even again, if you don't have all the skill and ability, maybe you come across somebody who does, you know, like that's the thing you get back there with a vehicle that's not working or stuck. Somebody else can come along. And if, if you don't have the jumper cable or you don't have the chunk of hose or you don't have the thing that needs, it may, means the difference between them being able to help you or them leaving you and, calling somebody else and the thing is they got to call a tow truck company to come in and get you you're looking at two and three hundred bucks oftentimes minimum just yep. to, you know uh, and there's and one that's why, oh, sorry i got you off again <laughs> the sorry it's just my fault too but the air pump or or the traction boards things like that you know people look at it and say oh that's expensive well it's going to cost you more than 100 bucks to get towed. So It's only expensive to the first time you need it. And you will find reasons to use it if you have it. Trust me. Yeah. Um, and what I have one last oddity that I take, kind of and kind of not. I keep a couple, or sorry, I keep a set of jumper cables. Not an oddity, but I also keep a couple welding rods in there too. 
Um, more so if you meet up with a buddy or you're traveling with groups and stuff like that. And I am not condoning people go out and do this, but for your own information, with two 12 volt batteries, you do actually have enough voltage you can do welding. Uh, you right. can attach them, get them up to 24 volt. I'm not going to tell you how, because either you know how to do that and okay, or you don't know how to do that and you shouldn't do it. Um, uh, run them up to 24 volt and with the jumper cables, you can actually do some basic spot welding. I mean, it's not uh, a significant amount. I wouldn't try and reconstruct a vehicle, but uh, we have tacked things together enough to get us out of the woods. You know, like a broken shock mount, something like that. You can jerry-rig it, snap a weld on it, and you'll wimp your way out. You, it just wants, again, to save that tow truck. Uh, it's not something, it's not our first go-to when I used to go out with our buddies, but it was always a backup, last-ditch-off, you know, resort. Because there's different complications that can go into this whole process. There's dangers involved with... You know, making sure the batteries are correct, not enough voltage, heat buildup, blown batteries up. So like I said, I'm not suggesting people go out there and do it. But in desperate situations, there is a way you can do it. Yeah. No. No. Yeah, you can do it. For sure. Positive. But, Seen it. Yeah. But. No. But And of course, the other option is jumper cables. You come across somebody that's just got a dead battery. Or that their charging system broke. You can pull over, you got lots of gas, you can let your vehicle idle, have a chit chat with them, maybe share a little of your food and water that you got, and you'll charge their battery up a little bit. Um, yeah, those those are some ideas. I mean, is that a comprehensive list? No, there's probably always a few extra things. But uh, those I'm are willing just things to you have. But we could go on for a couple of hours of times that we've both gotten. In situations we shouldn't have. Oh, for sure. Well, where do you think some of this list came from, Ben? It was learning <laughs> from past mistakes. Well, I spent a lot of time growing up, like, in the back roads and stuff. And so we we did go back. And it wasn't always my vehicle. But, you know, I can remember one trip I went to Newfoundland. And I decided, you know, I, I wanted to cut the time down. So there's a back road into to my hometown. And anyone who knows it knows it. And if you don't, you know unless someone shows you it don't try it <laughs> anyways i drove back to one time because somebody said oh it's good and it was in the spring and it wasn't good it wasn't by no means good and i get back there and obviously a skitter had gone up and <laughs> obviously because the hole he left was bigger than my truck well, this story kind of segues great into our next aspect. So this was the situation. You took something, it was supposed to be good, you're now, you know, halfway up the creek without a paddle, car breaks down. So why don't we talk about what you can do once it goes bad, now that we talked about a little preparedness and stuff like that, uh, as long as you're good, Ben. Yeah. And, um, because I, I think that was the re the follow-up question as well. I'll have to bring it back up now. But it was like, is there other things you can do once the car breaks down? And what's your best practices? Um, so, okay. In Ben's case, he was just trying to get home. The road was supposed to be good. Got up there, realized, oh, crap, it's not so good. Thought maybe. And I'm not saying Ben got stuck. Don't misunderstand, Ben. But he pushed it a little further. Got stuck. I, I didn't, but. <laughs> Hypothetically. So now we're stuck. Um, where do you go from here? Um, so the very first thing you do is assess the situation. So if you're stuck, you know, most people try the first thing, you know, back up, see if you can back out of it. Just don't keep pushing forward. If you tried to back up, tried to go forward, you can't, it's not moving at all. Tires are spinning. Don't keep spinning your tires. Ch chances are at this point, you're going to damage your tires or ruin your engine. Um, you know. Don't get frustrated. Stop. Take a deep breath. Get outside. Assess the situation. Um, how bad is it? Like, is the area in front or behind your vehicle pretty solid? If not, how far to the nearest piece of solid ground that you can sort of get to? Because if you're in sandy, muddy, slushy, boggy area, and you you manage to drift yourself in a ways, you're going to have to make the decision, do I continue going forward or do I try to back out of here and go back the way I came? Uh, but uh, yeah, you uh, you don't want to go that, that route and get yourself further in. 
Um, then, like we said already, consider dropping your tire pressure. If that's something that you have available to you, and I mean, it may get you out. I'm thinking boggy area, like you said. Sometimes you can get pretty hung up. You know what I mean? So, oh, yeah. But, you know, you don't need much. My daughter's giving me the eye. <laughs> but, I mean, in this situation, once you assess... If it's late, maybe you don't expend the effort to try and get yourself out that morning. Maybe now you're staying the night. If you have a little of the preparedness stuff we talked about, a candle and a blanket, well, you know what? It's not going to be the best night's sleep you had, but at least you'll get a little sleep and you can hit with a fresh set of eyes in the morning. If it's something you yeah. may be able to dig yourself out with, if you had those traction boards or a shovel that could double, there's going to be an option to get yourself out there. Yeah. Um but yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right, Ben. You have to objectively obsess the situation. Don't get frustrated. Don't get mad that you're hung up, like you said. Just, okay, yeah, it sucks, but where do I go from here? And you got to kind of keep that mentality as you go. Yeah. And and take to full stock, you know, how far am I away from help? You know, if you're relatively close, like if you're only a kilometer in, walking back and, and getting someone to come help you out, pretty good. Not a yeah. big deal. If you're 15, 20 kilometers in, now you're looking at the better part of a day to get out of there. Uh, and anyone who's looking for you is looking for your vehicle. So that needs to be considered. But then what's the likelihood anyone's looking for you? Does anyone know where you're to? Um, did you anyone... tell anyone you were going to go down that road or do they think you're coming down the main road? Yeah. Right. Uh, so a good example of that last year, I, uh, I was coming home. I had my daughter in the car with me. She's there so she can tell, tell you if this was true or not. And we decided to go exploring. Um, so we took an off-road trip. And uh, I had let my wife know that we were going to do that. We, we had a goal where we were hoping to get to. And uh, we very easily could have gotten stuck, damaged, ruined the tire. Like We went way back there. Uh, and that because people knew where we were to, had we broken down at the furthest point, we would have been there like a day to get it. But, you know, no doubt. And I think we were actually late getting home that night um, because we did have. It was soaked. Yeah, it was raining. We got soaked. Uh, but it was a good time, wasn't it? Just give me the. Just give maybe. me the evil eyes. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, you do have to assess your situation. Um, but usually if, if you're stuck like in most muddy, sandy things, if there's anything you can stick underneath your tire to get traction onto it, try that. Um, like I said, the traction boards, trees, boards, uh, bigger rocks, dig out around the tires so they have some room. They're not just like encased into the whatever's binding them up. And that's why having the shovel and the axe and the saw comes in handy having those extra tools the traction boards um, and try to get yourself out um, lowering the tire pressure gives you more surface area more traction more likely to get out um, make sure that you've cleared anything that could cause damage because once you're sunk down you never know you may have already gotten a rock or something wedged up against your transmission now you finally get yourself moving. Next thing you know, you're tearing the transmission, fuel lines, oil lines, coolant lines. Uh, you can do a lot of damage quite quickly if you don't check for what you're doing. And the worst thing is people get frustrated. In those situations, people start panicking. They start like revving it, moving it, and all of a sudden you do get traction. Next thing you know, you've just tore something out. Good story about that, and this is just a simple one. Uh, down in Mish, where I had the house fire that time, um, I responded to the fire. Long story there. But anyway, I called Dad to come down, and he came down with the fire trucks in the driveway. He went to pull around to the side of them, slipped down a little bit, like just a little bit of an incline, uh, to the point where the truck kind of got a little stuck on it. You know what I mean? Like he could drive up and down this it was like a ditch and he could straddle the ditch, but he couldn't bounce up out of the ditch. Uh, of course, with the heightened crankiness or whatever you want to call it, because the house had just burnt down. Uh, he got a little frustrated, came into it a little hard and it actually slid down further, ended up tearing the mirror off the truck and denting the door in all because just didn't slow down. So, yeah. 
Um, the absolute worst thing you can do in any panic situation is panic, uh, is to get frustrated, get angry, let your emotions control your actions. Uh, you know, it's easy for us to say this here, like, don't do it. But just if you're in the situation and you realize your emotions are starting to drive you, step back, step away, take a deep breath, think about what you're doing. Usually the situation is not nearly as bad as you think it is. But if you continue with this attitude, it will be. Uh, oh, it's very easy for a situation to go to bad to worse. Very yeah. easy. Honestly, yeah. a few misplaced actions. Let's just go with that because that could be a lot of things. Once again, a little too much gas. Maybe you didn't look behind you before you slammed it in reverse. Well, even like with your lug nuts. Yes, your lug nuts might be seized on. Yes, they may, may have been put on cross thread. It may be various reasons. But honestly, if you take your time, oftentimes little force here, a little force there, just wiggling it, playing with it, you can get them off. But if you get frustrated and stick the tire on in there and start jumping on it, next thing you know, you've broken a, nut, a lug nut off, a stud off. The, the wrench itself has been damaged or you're damaged. And I've seen it. I've seen people kick in the thing and next thing you know, it comes across their shins and they're bleeding, you know? Yep. Or they got their hands where it shouldn't be and now all of a sudden they nipped their hands and now, now you're, not only do you have a you know, a busted tire, but now you have a busted hand and it, you know, bad situation is now worse. Now your ability to get out of there is, is more in compromised, compromised. You know what a you... big one this goes with Ben and all honesty, mm -hmm. I've been to calls for this people get, it's coming on dark, get a flat in a hurry to get the Jack under it and Jack it up instead of taking the time to make sure everything's good and level pop the tire off you know sometimes you yourself have done this i'm sure you go to pop the tire off and it's stuck on the rotor ever so slightly so they start yanking on stuff next thing you know car's pulled off the jack hopefully it misses you worst case you now just made a bad situation a lot worse you know what you definitely have and and i've i have never pulled a vehicle off a jack but i've come damn close <laughs> And just mentioning that, there's a big thing with, you know, we talked about maintenance before. Take your tires off every 5,000 kilometers. Check them over. Put them Rotate back them together. Them. Never sees them. <laughs> Not the wheel never nuts, sees. but. But do it. Like, yeah. I had a buddy. This is a true story. I, I kid you not. He he was in Sackville, we'll say. Sackville. Yeah, we'll go with Sackville. He was in Sackville. And he called me up one day and he said he had all his lug nuts off. Tire wouldn't come off the, you know, off the vehicle. It stuck, stuck to the hub. So he, he backed all his lug nuts off a bit and drove it around a bit because someone said that would break it free and he'd be fine. He drove the better part of 30 minutes with no lug nuts on his vehicle got to my house, put it up on jacks. It was still seized on there. We were not able to easily remove it. And I ended up taking a spreader bar, running between the two tires to put an outward force on it, took a two by six and put across the rim and hit it with a sledgehammer. I finally came off. And finally came off. Like I had probably 200, 300 pounds of outward force and then hitting it with all I can swing onto that before it came loose and you know he was he drove for 40 minutes 30 40 minutes with that thing no lug nuts attached so and it didn't come loose so if you don't have your vehicle uh set up like if you haven't done the maintenance you haven't put the anti seize on haven't greased things haven't oiled things haven't done things then when you go to do repairs it's not going to be as easy, you know, like these things add up. Uh, I, t I put ever on my nuts every time. You see, I uh, don't put them on the wheel nuts. I put it literally on the, the rim certainly. where it touches the cow, like uh, on I the do, rotor. I do both. Uh, and you know, and then I, ch I do check my torque, you know, they say to check the torque within 50 to hundred kilometers. I do, you know, I change tires. I, I leave the, in the, uh, the impact, the, uh, torque wrench in the back of the vehicle for the next few days and 
I check a couple of times uh, and it doesn't take much. Uh, and when I put it on, I torque everything. Then I back it off and I torque it again. For stretching the lug threads? No. Um, believe it or not, you torque your first one and then you torque your last one. If you went back to the first one, a good chance you'd get another half turn on it, a quarter turn. Because the tire may not be fully seated it right. Mm -hmm. So when you torque them all, get them all right, just back them off a half a turn and then check them again. And just okay. make sure you did get good torque. And then do it again, you know. In your however torque. long kilometers. Uh, yeah. Just a couple comments here. So Dave's with us, Real Big Monkey one If anybody hasn't checked out his channel, be sure to. Another guy that does a lot of survival videos. Uh, I had a flat tire on the Jeep. I bought, uh, lo and behold, I went to change the tire and Jeep had specialty lug nuts. No wrench to fit it. These are things hopefully you find out before you go out in the woods. But if you don't, it puts you in a precarious situation. Um, yeah. And the and last... What's that? And we mentioned that earlier. Like, just make sure you have the right tools. It makes a big difference. And a new, I don't know if it's a new listener, but from Kentucky, we have Bushman32, uh, Bushcraft Living in the Woods. So I'm going to assume that's another YouTube channel there. Uh, big shout out to them. Be sure to check out their channel. I assume it's a channel. And they're saying hello from Kentucky. So we do have some listeners from the U.S. here now. That's always good. Uh, we do have a good amount of uh, you folks that tune in with us. Um, we always love hearing from you, and I'm sure your guys' experience is going to vary a little bit from ours because depending on where you're at, um, you may not have some of the challenges we have. You may have additional challenges, and that's things to take into mind when you are doing your pre-preparedness for this. If you're going to go out and do some deserty stuff, that water's probably going to be a lot more important. Is it ever? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so the, the big thing is an ounce of prevention's worth a pound of cure. You must have heard that old expression before, and honestly, it is true with this 100%. Take some time, put some basic supplies in your car, because that surprise trip always happens. And I know it does with me. Literally, I'll be going to, like, the old property of Merrigamish or Avondale or whatever like that, and I'll be like, oh, hey, I don't remember this road being here. Let's go see where it goes. And off you go, and you don't know what you're getting into. You never prepared for that for that day, but off you go. So you need some basic supplies. And then you have the adventures where you're like, oh, hey, Ben, let's go camping. We're going to go down this road. It looks like a crap road, but let's do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you can add a little bit more to your repertoire. If I knew it was a road neither of us had been down, I might put on a, a chainsaw. Like Ben said, he wanted an electric chainsaw. I got a little gas-powered one here. Maybe I throw that on back because it's going to be a lot easier to cut that tree down with a chainsaw than it is going to with a buck saw or, you know, doing it with an axe. So you can plan a little bit, and if things do go bad, big number one thing, take the time to assess the situation correctly and don't just jump into actions. Be a proactive person. Think about what is happening, what could happen. Don't be a reactive person because when you start reacting, generally that's where a lot of the problems come up. I don't know if you've ever heard of, uh, you know what, I'll leave the name off because I don't know if I can say it or not. But uh, I can say this much. If you look at high-risk, low-frequency situations, and anybody that knows those two words together knows who I'm talking about already, uh, he does a great presentation on that. If you YouTube or Google the high-risk, uh, low-frequency, you're going to get this video, and it's amazing. And just kind of look at an adventure in the woods through his little lecture, and I bet you're going to be a lot more better off. Yeah. Um, the other thing, if you can do it, and I know it's not, not for everyone, but if you can do it, take a buddy. Yeah, second, for sure. Second vehicle with the equipment makes all the difference in the world. Um, it and really does. That's even when you're four wheeling, like a lot of people that I got ATVs, uh, you generally go with a buddy simply because, oh, there's a water hole here. You wait here. I'll attempt it and see how it is. And then you're only dealing with one stock vehicle and one good vehicle that if you got to go back, the option is there. Or it can assist you in getting out of that situation. Yeah, yeah oh. 100%. Uh, Dave, again, a friend of mine lives so far out in the woods that he always kept a bicycle in the bed of his truck in case he broke down. Once again, understanding your situation. I've, I actually have been that far out in the woods. I am not going to lie. <laughs> I never carried a bicycle. Brilliant idea, though. I, 
I think I mentioned it before here. If I haven't, it, it's definitely. Uh, I haven't been big on bicycles for a while, but now when I'm moving, one of the things is I'm giving up a lot of stuff I've had. One of the things I was planning on getting back into was was cycling, and I was thinking of picking up a little one of those little e-bikes because I think they're neat. Uh, and that is actually one of my plans to keep that with the vehicle. So when I go, there's a lot of things you can explore with that smaller, more lightweight vehicle um, than you could without it. And my brother, he loves doing this sort of stuff. He has a little Jeep Renegade that he runs, and he picked up a little Hyundai Grown. Hyundai Grown, yep. And he loves that thing. He's got it. He got like dirt tires put on it. He's got like a little off-road kit done up on it. And he takes that everywhere and anywhere. And that thing you can hook on a, you know, you don't even need like a trailer. Like you can just hook it to the hitch of your vehicle type. The bicycle style. supposed to be under the weight because those bicycle carriers are good for a couple hundred pounds, I think. Yeah. So, but there's, there's the ones with the. Oh, I know the ones you're talking about. It's got like the little pull on. Yeah. 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 Um, still, it puts him out sideways. It's such a small vehicle that he takes, he'll take that there. So that there gives you a second option out, right? Second set of wheels. So yeah, I've got my main set sunk, but I can still get out. So it's a great idea. And honestly, the Grom, you could almost like carry the darn thing through a swamp if you had to. Oh, Realistically, yeah. they're like 200 and some pounds wet. Like they're, they're nothing weight wise. Even that? I don't know. I'm just guessing. I like, I've only ridden one once. To be perfectly honest with you, and it was six years ago, maybe five years ago, six years ago. I, no, I've never drove one, but it, they look cool. Kawasaki makes a little one now. A couple of them jumped on board, but the the Honda Grom, it's uh, it's actually an amazing little vehicle. Two hundred twenty eight pounds. There you go. Approximately. Approximately, of course, depending <laughs> on what your oil weight is. <laughs> Okay, that was too bad of a uh, dad joke. Hi, Rich. Weight measured, full of gas and ready to ride. So. Uh, But yeah, so I think that's pretty good for that topic. We might have, I hope we answered all the questions that were asked. Not our typical kind of topic, but kind of our typical kind of topic at the same time. You know what I mean? It was just, I thought it was a great way to answer the question and get a little more in depth into it because every situation is different. Uh, what we're doing up here in Canada, much like I mentioned, Dave and Bushman down there, they may do something completely different, but the idea is use your head a little bit, think about what you're going to go and try to prepare the best you can for what could happen. And if you end up, you might need to sleep in the vehicle for a night, get a fresh perspective on it in the morning. There's no sense banging around in the dark, potentially hurting yourself and just tiring yourself out and maybe getting sick if it's cold and wet. You know what I mean? It's just not worth it. You know, I think for the most part, it's very similar worldwide. Like I've watched people doing this stuff in the, in the States, in uh, Australia, in Europe. Uh, but almost everyone starts their adventures really uh, with a vehicle. Like you drive to your starting point oftentimes, your, your trailhead, your, your campsite. So having the stuff there just makes sense. And, you know, the more bushcrafty off, you know, off the beaten paths often requires a few kilometers you know out of the way so having having your vehicle prepped um you know makes the difference and sometimes you just push yourself a little too far i mean when we went camping by the the waterfall think of all that shale we drove over on motorcycle tires oh yeah were we endangered no was it stupid yes Yeah, and we were driving like purely street bikes down stuff that I think some people would have been like, I'm not sure I'd want want to bring my dirt bike down there. (laughs) But such is life. So I think good spot for us to end it there tonight. We're coming up on our hour almost exactly. Uh, Huge shout out to the people that joined us here live tonight. Chris Loveless, uh, Dave Real Big Monkey One. Once again, check out his channel. And from Kentucky, Bushman32, Bushcraft Living in the Woods. Uh, hopefully they have a channel and you folks can go check that out too. Um, was there anything else you want to say on this, Ben, before we sign off for the night, bud? No, I think that's, that's a good part of it. I mean, we could obviously go for a couple more hours, but it would be stories and people might get bored of us. So, so get out there, have fun, you know, get up a little kit, put in your vehicle and, uh, you know, send us a story. Send us a picture. 
Always love to hear the stories, love to hear the questions. Uh, and you can get a hold of us as you see down there on all our social medias, website, Facebook, all that stuff. So until next time, get dirty, have fun, play safe.